It's both amazing and mind-boggling to think about how bridges are built. After all, these structures can be built on massive scales and be used to transport tens of thousands of vehicles every single day. And when you think about how these marvels of engineering are built over large bodies of water, there are even more questions that will come to mind. Before construction begins, planners must test the site for soil near the bridge site for strength, depth, land layout, and other elements to ensure the safety and durability of the final structure. Using the results of these tests and with the help of computer-aided design, engineers can picture the bridge's behavior under different weights and weather conditions to determine the type of bridge to build and how to build it. After planning is complete, workers break ground on the job site and begin installing the bridge's foundation. Naturally, with the process of building over large bodies of water, you'll need to build underwater. With smaller bodies of water, Construction might actually involve getting rid of the water or avoiding it altogether so that you're not actually building underwater at all as it can be a dangerous and unsafe task. However, removing water from bridge projects is not possible in a lot of cases and the most you can do is alter and displace the water making it easier to build. Although professional divers can accomplish a wide variety of tasks like welding, cutting, and erecting formwork and other structures while underwater, this isn't exactly the safest or most effective method for construction. This kind of underwater work is typically achieved with the help of scuba equipment that allows them to breathe and stay warm. But professional diving is dangerous, and the types of tools and equipment that both function underwater and can be used safely by a diver are fairly limited. To achieve the dewatering of a construction site, all possible means and methods of construction equipment and techniques have been invented and applied aimed at allowing safe and efficient construction of the structures in the most waterlogged places where it would be near impossible to build anything. The method that's used to build bridges over water is one of the most popular ways to build any overwater foundation for a structure. Essentially, battered piles are large foundational poles that are driven into the soil underneath the water in order to create a stand-like base for the structure on top. Usually made with reinforced concrete or steel, large piles are inserted into the submerged ground using pile drivers, which are large mechanical devices. Piles and pile drivers are usually transported to their intended location on a floating pile driving barge. It may be easier to think of a pile as a nail and the pile driver as a hammer. A pile of appropriate size is set onto the subsurface of the body of water and then hammered down by the pile driver. The piles are battered either outward or inward at an angle, thus allowing them to support the lateral load of the upper bridge structure, while also being able to withstand the currents of the water. Piles are usually installed in groups that are further apart at the bottom and closer together at the top, essentially forming the shape of a triangle. The next step is to install the pile caps on the top of the pile grouping. Pile caps are placed on top of a grouping of multiple piles in order to create a stable foundation and offer a larger area for the distribution of the building load onto the piles. Once this is done, the upper bridge structure is ready to be built. Now that you know the different methods for creating the foundation for overwater bridges, you can start to imagine how the upper part of an overwater bridge is built. After all, the foundation of a structure is often the most important part. Once the bottoms of the bridge piers are in place, crews build upward until each pier has reached its predetermined height. Once the piers get installed, it's time to add supportive structures like the abutments, which are located at each end of the bridge and created to withstand horizontal force. Other support features might include beams, bridge bearings, and retaining walls. These components all make up the substructure, ensuring proper reinforcements to support the superstructure. These supports can consist entirely of concrete or use a combination of steel or other materials, depending on the bridge's type and size. The superstructure includes all components that directly receive the load, including girders, arches, or suspension cables, depending on the bridge type. Then, it's time to build the bridge deck and roadway, incorporating appropriate materials like concrete, asphalt, and rebar. Crews will also install safety features such as guardrails, lighting, and signage during this step. To install the superstructure, 
Engineers must harness various materials and assemble structures that maintain support when exposed to wind, gravity, and other natural forces present in the area. Once construction is complete, crews perform safety tests using cranes and bridge booms to ensure that the structure meets all quality standards. These tests allow engineers to rule out or address any structural flaws and move forward with installing the final paving and electrical systems. The cost to build a bridge is anywhere between just $1,000 and over $10 million or more, depending on the type and size of the bridge you're planning to build and other essential factors. The Golden Gate Bridge cost $35 million to build in the 1930s, which is approximately $666 million in today's dollars. However, while bridges bring undeniable economic and social benefits, they can also have significant environmental impacts. Bridge construction often disrupts these ecosystems, whether on a river, a forest, or a wetland. It would knock down trees, displace animals, and change the environment. An aquatic habitat might harm the fish's living places, damaging the river or lake ecosystem. Some species that need special habitats for breeding, feeding, or migration suffer because they cannot adapt to the new environment. Construction near bodies of water often leads to the preventable pollution of these vital resources. While construction is a necessary human activity, the careless disposal of construction site materials into rivers, lakes, or streams is entirely avoidable. Construction sites, as the largest generators of construction and demolition debris, can take steps to prevent excess debris from contaminating water sources. Building sites that use heavy equipment punch through debris and rock, leaking oil and other fluids or gases like gasoline or aromatic hydrocarbons into groundwater or water bodies. A toxic mixture of construction pollutants can enter the water through direct spills, metals, and chemicals that settle into the soil. Concrete from buildings and roads can seep into aquifers or run off into rivers, lakes, and streams if the concrete's not disposed of properly. Another significant concern in bridge construction is the long-term impact of soil erosion. When land is cleared or graded for the bridges or its approaches, the loss of vegetation leaves the soil vulnerable to erosion by wind or water. This erosion can have lasting effects, affecting the landscape and potentially leading to further environmental damage. In the beginning, bridges were simple structures built from easily accessible natural resources, wooden logs, stones, and dirt. Because of that, they could only span very close distances, and their structural integrity was not high because the mortar was not yet invented, and rain slowly but constantly dissolved the dirt fillings of the bridge. A revolution in bridge construction came in ancient Rome whose engineers found that grinding out volcanic rocks could be an excellent material for making mortar. This invention enabled them to build much sturdier, more powerful, and larger structures than any civilization. Seeing the power of roads and connections to distant lands, Roman architects soon spread across Europe, Africa, and Asia, building bridges and roads of very high quality. One of the defining successes of Roman bridge architecture was the discovery of arches. Using this type of building, load forces of the bridge were conveyed to move along the curve of the arch, meeting with the ground where supports on the end of the arch canceled them. Because of that, Romans were able to create bridges that were much lighter than before and held loads twice as heavy as the bridge itself. After the fall of the Roman Empire, bridge building techniques in Europe and Asia stagnated until the 18th century. If we ignore the introduction of rope suspension bridges that were brought back to Europe from Central and South America, when the new age of science and engineering swept across the world, architects of that time started using new construction material, cast iron. Iron enabled the creation of new bridge designs such as truss systems. Sadly, wrought iron did not have the tensile strength to support heavy structures which was fixed with the advent of steel and the ideas of famous French architect and engineer Gustave Eiffel. Thanks for sticking around to learn how bridges are made, from planning to completion. If you found this breakdown interesting, be sure to hit the like button and share it with anyone curious about construction or engineering. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss our next deep dive into fascinating topics like this one.